are ready to go. We've been talking about ancestors, primarily of Rhode Island, settled Rhode Island. And it's been a great blessing to see what God has done with my life. Only God could have done it. 46 years holy following God. Had a few crooked places that had to be straightened, but we never got out of bounds. Thank God. So, today, Paul Peters is going to be talking about Stukely or Stuckley Westcott's going to be reading. But I have to tell you a funny story. My mother was a Baptist. And if I had cast three devils out of her, I think she'd have gone to heaven with Baptist. But I cast three devils out of my Baptist mother who told God, you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. I found that out when I was in my fifties. But thank God for mother and dad. A great blessing. So when we first, researchers first saw Westcott's name and others, they thought they were Baptists. And everybody that worked with me at that time got a big laugh. Aha, you're a Baptist. I said, well, I don't care what I am. I'm a Jew inwardly. But it turned out they were not Baptists. They were six principal doctrine foundation of the church. Thank God. So here we go, Paul Peters. I'm going to read to you, and we'll comment if the Lord directs. Paul, let's go. All right. Stuckley Westcott was born in England, probably about 1592, and his marriage to Julianne Marchant is recorded in St. John's Church in Newville, Somerset, England, on October 5, 1619. A number of sources suggest the couple had six children who all came with them to America. Historians have also written that the William Arnold family and also William Carpenter sailed with the Westcotts from England in 1635. This information is found in Benedict Arnold's writings from Old Family Papers, saying, On June 24, 1635, arrived in Massachusetts Bay, sailed from Dartmouth of Devon, May 1, 1635, all but one of the party, William Carpenter, coming from Leicester in southern Somerset, more than five miles of that place. My father, William Arnold, and his family set sail from Dartmouth in Old England the 1st of May, Friday, and arrived in New England June 24, 1635. On board was Stuckley Westcott, 43, of Uville, and his wife with children Robert, Damaris, Samuel, Amos, Mercy, and Jeremiah. Benedict Arnold later married Stuckley's daughter, Damaris. The history and genealogy of the ancestors and descendants of Stuckley Westcott make reference to two brothers of Stuckley, Richard and William Westcott, who are first recorded in Salem in 1636, and they both later settled in Connecticut. A record in 1636 lists Stuckley as a grantee of land, but the extent of the grant is not named. However, he would have been made a free man in order to have received a land grant. He was granted one acre of land at a town meeting in Salem, according to town records, in the latter part of 1635, listing his name as Stucky Westcott, <laughs> naming him as one of the inhabitants in Freeman, and listing the number of persons in his house as eight. Stuckley and his family were members of the Church of Salem, where Roger Williams had taught and been excommunicated from and Westcott was seemingly of the same mind as Williams, saying, first, that the members of Salem Church should make public confession of their wrong in having formally communed with the Church of England. Secondly, 
that the civil magistrate had no lawful authority or right to take cognizance of or punish a person for his religious beliefs. Westcott, along with Richard Waterman, Thomas Olney, and Francis Weston, were ordered by the General Court in March 1638 to remove from the jurisdiction of the Governor and Company of the Massachusetts Bay, along with their families before the next General Court. The charge was heresy. At the same time, notice was sent by Hugh Peters to the Church at Dorchester of the order to prevent them from being received into membership there. They followed Roger Williams to Providence, and Stuckley was one of the twelve whom Williams wrote of when he freely admitted twelve loving friends and neighbors into ownership of lands he had purchased in 1636. Stuckley's was the first name listed on the Williams grant to the twelve associates of Providence. He was also one of the founders of the First Church of Providence, recorded as a sixth principal church being baptized by Roger Williams along with ten others. They obeyed the scriptures as they understood them, practicing the first principles of the oracles of God found in Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This... I want to say something. All right. 1973, Argyle, Texas, Denton County, one county to the west. God had led me by his spirit out into that. It was a wilderness for me. Beautiful area. Large homes. A lot of wealth there. And God put me out there to try me, to humble me, to show me what was in my heart and to show me whether I keep his commandments. Those were frightening days, frankly, because I had forsaken, left my veterinary hospital and practice, sold it to a partner, and I brought in uh, after I had it almost built, well, it was built. Uh, and I knew it was right to sell what happened of it to him. And it was, I made a good deal to him. I knew what God wanted. I was pretty sure in my heart that Dr. Butler would buy my practice and hospital. But I didn't say it. When the Lord told me he'd buy it, I said, he won't buy it. The Lord said, I'll make him buy it. Well, he did. But in 73, in Argyle, a young man from Florida, I met in Florida, came out of California, really, out of the hippie movement. <laughs> And went to South Florida. That's where I met Mike and Pat Reed. And they came through Argyle on their way to somewhere, I don't know where now, and stopped and stayed two or three or four days with us. And I was talking to Mike about the foundation. He said, Don't you know where it's at? Well, no. Well, it's Hebrews 6. I looked. Oh, how blind can you be? God wanted Mike Reed to show me that. Always appreciate Mike and Pat. Love them. Thank God. But I started right then studying those six principles that are listed there in Hebrews chapter 6. I had no idea that my ancestors taught those very things almost 400 years ago. Uh, it has encouraged me since quite a bit. Go ahead. This rebaptism caused great offense to the church at Salem 
and when the church elders learned of it, the Westcotts and others were excommunicated. They called it a rebaptism because although these men were born in England, and the Church of England practiced infant baptis baptism, so then when they got a revelation of this Hebrews 6, they baptized as they understood according to how they understood the Bible. Amen. Records indicate in October 1638, Stuckley contributed two pounds and ten shillings toward defraying the town expenses, and, when it, and it was one of the largest contributions to the common good of the community. In 1642, there was an agreement for the division of Pawtuxet from Providence, of which Stuckley was a party to. Records and letters reflect there was much dissension within the community with land divisions and ownership, and it is at this time that Samuel Gorton had made an attempt to settle in the Providence area of Pawtuxet, resisting being drawn into the internal conflicts of the community. Also at the same time, the larger, more powerful Massachusetts Bay Colony was attempting to extend their jurisdiction over the settlers in Rhode Island, desiring the rich resources available in that area and to stamp out what they considered heretical ideas. By December 1642, Gordon and others purchased a Chalmette area from my autonomy, Chief Sachem of the Narragansett, which put the new colony outside of Massachusetts by a distance of about 25 miles. There are no... I want to say okay. something. Kathy Day, yeah. what is that scripture in Matthew where to take the kingdom from Israel and give it to another country to bring forth fruit thereof? Matthew 21. 43. 21, 43. Let's look at that right okay. now. That Kathy Day uh, got a revelation of that. This is what Jesus said about Israel and referring to America. And when all of our ancestors came, uh, the Mayflower and the ones to Rhode Island, that's when God brought the kingdom of God from Israel and put it in America. And it started out with our ancestors. Would you read that? Matthew 21, 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Katie, where would you get that? In 08? 08. 08. She sent me an email, right? Yes. Tell me that. And I thought, well, this is America. Amen. And that's what it is. Then we found out about all of our ancestors. So you see what I say. God sent my ancestors here so I could preach the gospel. I'm not kidding. We got scripture that's in 08. It was revealed to a prophetess, Kathy D. Thank God. And she sent it to me. I told her she was a prophetess once. And she sent, sent me back an email and said, Know this, this prophetess came out of your heart. I know that. Amen. Now, let's move on. All right. There are no writings that specifically state the reason West Cod left Providence for Shalmet, but it was a very turbulent time for the surrounding settlements of the area with land disputes and personal differences over biblical doctrine and civil liberty. The ancient records reflect that Stuckley and his family came to Shalmet in 1647. However, the book the history and genealogy of the ancestors and descendants of Stuckley Westcott states that it is reasonably certain that he was at least active at Warwick as early as the spring of 1643 because he is one of the nine persons that was taken to Boston when Massachusetts sent a company to arrest the group at Warwick. Also included in the genealogy was the statement recorded in the old records that the soldiers have killed one of his sheep at the time the group was arrested. Stuckley is listed seventh on the list of the inhabitants of the town previous to June 5th, 1648, of 31 settlers, and two of his sons were listed 17th and 27th. The men were imprisoned, charged, found guilty at Boston, and sentenced to hard labor, but after a few months were pardoned due to public sentiment of the towns where they were fulfilling their sentences. 
Stockley's name is not found in the towns where the men served their sentences, so he may have been allowed to return to Warwick. However, he is one of those who bore witness on March 30th, 1644, under oath to the outrage committed upon property and the persons of the first settlers of Warwick because they refused to subject themselves to the pretended jurisdiction of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Amen. During the summer of 1648, Stuckley Westcott, John Green, William Arnold, and nine others of Warwick agreed to support in faith and practice the principles of Christ's doctrine. They met in homes and groves and attended the gathering of Providence as often as circumstances would allow. An actual church building in Warwick wasn't built until several years after Stuckley had died. In 1655, Stuckley was licensed to keep a house of entertainment or a tavern and to set out a sign at the most perspicuous place. His hotel license was renewed in 1664 when he was authorized to keep an ordinary tavern or hotel for the entertainment of strangers during the time the king's commissioners held court at Warwick. History has shown that oftentimes those who became innkeepers owned large houses at central points on the roads. Below is an excerpt of an article explaining the importance of the tavern in the colonial days. In the middle of the 18th century, taverns lay in the, at the center of life in the British American mainland colonies. People ate, drank, and slept there. They read mail and papers and other ways got the news. They boarded stages from and voted at taverns. They attended court hearings and committed crimes. Tavern keepers themselves were often respected and influential citizens, and tavern keeping was viewed as an important and economically viable occupation, including for women. As a point of fact, taverns were everywhere. They housed everything, and everyone could be involved. They were the so social and cultural centers of colonial life. The colonial government found taverns so important to the development of this new land, they enacted laws to encourage their construction. Well, I want to say something. My ancestors, Cash Wright's ancestors, they were bold people. Right. That's where Cash Wright and I got our boldness. Hmm. Let's move on. Amen. Westcott was quite involved in the settlement of, at Warwick and recorded to preserved records, owning along with his home lot a large acreage, as did the other initial founders. He had retained his land interest in Providence after moving to Warwick, and as well he stated that he, together with Samuel Gordon, Randall Holden, Thomas Collins, and John Potter, were the sole owners of a tract of land totaling about 2,100 acres between the Pawtuxet lands on the north and the Old Warwick lands on the south. He apparently elicited the confidence of his fellow man, holding, holding numerous public offices, the highest office he held was deputy of the colonies, which he held in November 1651 and February 1652, and also December of 1652, representing Warwick in the Colonial Assembly, and again in 1656 and 1660. He was nearly 80 years old when he served his last term as deputy in, to the Assembly in 1671. In 1653, he was elected twice as general assistant, and these officers, usually two from each colony, formed the governor's council and also exercised judicial power. He served on a committee to call the special assembly if needed, as the colony was in imminent danger during that time. He also served on a committee to restrict the sale of liquor to the Indians and to regulate excise and sale of it in the colony. In local issues, his fellow townsmen chose him and Ezekiel Holloman to collect monies of the settlers to pay a person for watching over their cattle from Indian intrusion, and he served as a member of the town council. He was a commissioner for Warwick numerous years, surveyors of highways, listed as a jurist, and also sat on a committee to confer with Indians about fencing and other matters, probably acting as a liaison between the Indians and colonists diffusing problems when the colonists' cattle damaged the Indian crops. Amen. 
Another notable event that speaks to the character of Stuckley, his neighbor at Warwick, John Bennett, probably aged and without family, gave his property, eight cattle and 19 pounds of pig at eight per penny. And pig is a old currency used by the Abor Aboriginal people. In his house and land, all except five pounds, which Bennett retains to dispose of as he may see fit, on the condition that Westcott and his heirs furnish him his life with meat, drinks, and apparel. Later it is recorded, Amos Westcott, who is living with his father at the time, is excused on October 10, 1670, by the town from service at the three courts by reason of the weak condition of John Bennett. And Amos needed needing to personally attend to him during his illness, obviously fulfilling the promise of taking care of the elderly man. Stuckley's wife preceded him in death, as did his son, Robert. His son, Amos Westcott, and wife apparently went to live with him and care for him in his last years. At the onset of the King Philip's War, Robert Westcott, a lieutenant of the militia, was killed in the Great Swamp Fight in 1675, in which the Indians suffered great losses. The Indians returned to execute vengeance, burning every house in Warwick except one, and the inhabitants all fled, Stuckley going to live with his grandson, Caleb Arnold, son of Benedict and Damaris Westcott at Portsmouth. He died there on January 12, 1677. Stuckley has deeded much of his land to his sons as gifts during his lifetime. He wrote a will which was never executed because apparently his grandson had encouraged him to wait to sign it until Amos and Jeremiah, his two remaining sons, could be present, and he became incapacitated before they arrived. Because his will wasn't signed, and there being mention of additions that were verbalized, the town council drew up a will, and it was sealed by John Green, assistant, Samuel Gordon, assistant, Randall Holden, Thomas Green, and Benjamin Borton, who comprised the town council years later. Stuckley Westcott's descendants are many, and a few of the notable ones are General Benedict Arnold, descendant of his daughter Damaris, who married Governor Arnold, and General of the Revolutionary War, who is better known as a traitor to his country. Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry and Commodore Matthew C. Perry, Doyle and David Casbright both trace their ancestry to Stuckley Westcott through his son, Jeremiah and Eleanor England Westcott. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Very interesting ancestors. Amen. Brave men and women. What they did, they forsook England for the U.S. They fought the English. It's amazing when you think about the English. Uh, I recall something I said once, and I thought maybe it was arrogance, but it was God. My family was, some of my family met Derek Prince and Lydia, and Lydia had a different spirit than Derek. Uh, Lydia was very encouraging to me, and they wanted me to join the discipleship movement. I said, it's not God. I will not. It is not God. But when I was told about Derek and Lydia, I said, well, why are you all following an Englishman? We ran them out once. And that didn't go over very well. But you know what? That was God in me. There he said to me once, why don't you take my messages and preach them? I said, no, it's not God. I got my own. <laughs> I'm overcoming a, a Britisher. I happen to love Derek Pratt. Good friends, both of us, one to the other. Each respected the other a lot. 
that the discipleship movement was not God, and I knew it. The reason I knew it is I was a prophet. And that's all there is to it. It wasn't my wisdom. It was the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ in me. So it led to that Derek goes to Israel, which I also minister in Israel. <laughs> I'm sent to Israel as well as him. But then I find all my ancestors that established Rhode Island are teaching or taught the same things that God taught me beginning in 1973. Nothing encouraged my desire to follow what I believed was God. And now I'm more convinced than ever, well, I'm persuaded like Abraham. Romans 4, I'm persuaded who I am in the Lord. Took a long time. God knows it. when he would talk to me back in the 70s, I'd say, if this is you, bring it to pass. I wouldn't say, I believe it. No way. I just said, if this is you, Lord, you bring it to pass. Well, guess what? A bunch of things that I said, if this is you, bring it to pass, he has brought to pass. And I'm just real happy. I want to say on this broadcast, we have a work in Zimbabwe. And it's a strong work. And it's increasing. And God sent me there in 85. And I spent 15 days in Zimbabwe. And those people are my people. And I know it. I've sent a lot of money to Zimbabwe. I'm talking about American dollars. And a lot of audio tapes. Now, Things are really developing. The work in Zimbabwe. You haven't seen anything yet. What do we do next? You want to talk about John Green? Sure. All right. This John Green is your ancestor. And David Cashbright also has an ancestor named John Green, but there are two different John Greens. Oh. <laughs> but this John Green... He was born in England about 1606. According to family histories, he left England in 1635 as a young man, first sailing to the West Indies on the ship called the Matthew. Within a few months, finding the people there a godless set, he sailed to Massachusetts. He eventually left Massachusetts because of the oppressive rule of government, and the authorities were endeavoring there to dictate man's conscience in matters relating to religion. He removed to Quidneset about 1639 with Richard Smith, who was 10 years older than him. Smith also had emigrated from England to America and eventually left Massachusetts buying land from, from the Narragansett Indians on the western side of the Narragansett Bay and built a trading post at Quidneset, which the settlers later called Quidneset, later called King's Province in about 1637, according to Roger Williams' writings. Richard Smith was the first white person to settle in that area of Narragansett, and he and his family were the only white people there for years. John Green worked for Richard Smith and lived with the Smith family for a number of years and became a landholder in his own right. Roger Williams was a friend and colleague of Richard Smith, and Williams and a Mr. Wilcox purchased land, and built a trading post about a mile north of the Smiths. They traded with the Indians in the area, and the trading posts were on the well-traveled Pequot Path and served many travelers. 
Williams later sold his trading post and his holdings to Richard Smith to finance his trip to England to secure the second charter for Providence in the nearby colonies. The area at Quidnesset became involved in a land dispute after a land company comprised of speculators from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in Connecticut and headed by Major Humphrey Atherton purchased much of the region in what later was deemed to be an illegal purchase and the controversy lasted for years. Richard Smith was one of the few Rhode Islanders in the company and one of the original shareholders. John Green was also a shareholder, though not one of the original, but a somewhat prominent figure in the community at that time. The dispute was eventually settled in May 1671, and the following was written by John Green. King's Province in Narragansett, 21st of July, 1679. To all whom this may concern, I, John Green, inhabiting in the Narragansett country called King's Province, I, being a sworn conservator of the peace, do on my oath affirm that 40 years and more ago, Richard Smith, that I then lived with, did first begin and make a settlement in the Narragansett, and that by the consent and approbation of the Indian princes and people, and did improve land, mow metals, several years before, work was settled by an Englishman, and I, being present, did see and hear all the Narragansett princes being assembled together, give by livery and seizing some hundreds of acres of land, about a mile in length, and so down to the sea. This being about 30 years ago, many hundred Indians being present, consenting thereunto. This I certify to be true, as I am in public office, on oath and under my hand. John Green. John married his wife, Joan, about 1641, and there's some dispute over her last name. In Governor Winthrop's writing, he mentions one green who made the wife of one beggarly. It is written they had nine children, and John divided his land between some of his sons before he and his wife's deaths. Joan Green died sometime after 1682, and it is believed John lived with his son, also named John, in Covenantry until his death in 1695. Benjamin Green, the youngest of John and Joan's children, was born in about 1665 and married Humility Coggeshaw, the daughter of Joshua and Joan Coggeshaw, and the granddaughter of John Coggeshaw, who served as president of Providence Plantation. Benjamin and Humility Coggeshaw Green had at least 12 children. Their son, John, married Mary Ellsworth, the daughter of Arthur and Mary Ellsworth, and the great-granddaughter of Obadiah Holmes and Chad Brown. Benjamin and Humility's daughter Phoebe married Thomas Wells. Dole Davison traces his lineage to John Green of Quidnesset through his mother, Alba Sarah Miller Davidson. Most remarkable, Dole Davidson's great-great-grandmother, Vastia Green Miller, is a third great-granddaughter of both John and Mary Ellsworth Green and Thomas and Phoebe Green Wells.